give him an introduction? Yeah, so hi, I'm Anne, I'm the other co-director. And first I wanna, for those of you joining on YouTube, I want you guys to, um, so I'm gonna give instructions on how to ask questions during the AMA. So if you go to menti.com and use the code 5370, and that should be on the top right of the stream, um, you can ask questions on there um, and it'll show up and we'll ask questions, um, we'll pick questions from there as well. If you have a question that you see that you like, uh, make sure to thumbs it up and we'll pick the top questions. Um, so first I'll introduce Tolly. Um, Tolly is um, a serial entrepreneur that has um, founded many startups and currently he's working as a mentor capitalist um, in advising investors and also as a um, consultant and strategic advisor to um, SRI International, which is a nonprofit science um, research institute, institute, which has launched um, many su successful startups, um, including Siri, which is um, Apple's voice assistant, as you know. So um, first, Tolly will be giving uh, a brief summary of his professional career and his own transition to high school and uh, from high school to college. And then after that, we'll move on to the Q&A. All right, thank you for the introduction. Let me set up the sharing and you let me know if it works. Uh, let's see. something up here, hold on. That's fine, that will do. Okay. That's fine. All right, can you see the screen? Yeah. All right, sweet. All right. So I'm Tolly. This is Christine, my better half next to me. Uh, we are both nerds and oddballs, so that applies to both of us. So if you ask me anything, it's really meant to be anything. Whatever comes to your mind, feel free to ask, and I'm happy to answer. But because I'm not like a famous celebrity, uh, plus I have an accent, I figured you might need uh, a little bit of a background on me so that you can ask uh, relevant questions that I can hopefully answer in a constructive, helpful way. So as you can tell from the accent, I was not uh, born in the US. I was actually uh, raised in Greece. And that was in the, late, the late 1980s. That was before the internet, if you can imagine a time like that. <laughs> uh, so I'm old and that's how it goes. I'm 50 years old, uh, but I still remember the time in high school quite well. Uh, one thing that was unique and different than the time today is that back then computer science was not really something taught in classes. It was a very new field. Uh, most of us who were into computers were pretty much learning on our own at home from uh, uh, home computers that our parents bought us or they bought for themselves. Most of us were playing games. Uh, that's what I wanted to do too. That's the reason I wanted a computer. But my dad actually tricked me and he bought me a computer where uh, games were very hard to find. And so I had to learn how to write uh, software in order to play games. And of course, I ended up realizing I enjoyed the programming of the game more so than playing it itself. Uh, after I had already coded it, coded it, I knew all the tricks anyway. So I had my sister as the guinea pig, actually. She was the one playing the games that I was writing. Uh, and uh, as I said, most of that learning at the time happened from books, uh, maybe from magazines at the time. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much how I learned basic. And uh, basic was the language that we were learning at uh, as, a, as an introductory language for computer programming at the time. You couldn't do much with it, but I learned the principles that way. Uh, having said that, because that wasn't the subject at school, it didn't really translate into anything from an academic standpoint. So uh, from uh, the school classwork, I was mostly good in mathematics, physics, science uh, type stuff. But because I wanted to go to uh, university abroad, I had to study and work hard in other subjects as well. Uh, and being in Greece, uh, as you might know, ancient Greece is all about balancing the body and the mind. And one of the sayings in Greek is, to have a healthy mind in a healthy body. So I was actually pretty decent in athletics as well. Uh, something that essentially helped me maintain a decent health throughout the times that I would be spending in you know, all nighters writing code and drinking Coke uh, and other caffeine and sugary drinks 
instead of living a normal life. So that uh, uh, early emphasis on exercise actually paid off long term and it still pays off. Uh, the other thing about my coursework is because I was going to study abroad, I had uh, to spend spent quite some time learning English as a foreign language, of course. Uh, and the emphasis was not so much in learning English the way, you know, for uh, literature and Shakespeare and all that and poetry, although I did a little bit of that. It was much more on learning casual English, understanding the culture I was about to enter, not just the language. And so that was my excuse for, for watching a lot of movies. Uh, and I would actually watch them in English, so not dubbed. And I would put a piece of paper over the subtitles so that I wouldn't... Uh, uh, be lured into reading the Greek underneath instead of uh, uh, listening to the English and learning from that. Uh, the other thing about my education in high school that was interesting is I took an extra year. A lot of my classmates actually felt very reluctant. Uh, they felt that uh, to waste a year at that time would be horrible. Now looking back, that year meant nothing in the terms of delaying my career or anything like that. But it actually allowed me to have a much stronger application to schools in the US and the UK, which is where I applied. Uh, and that extra here was unique because all the coursework was in English and it made it much easier to transition to Stanford later. In fact, it effectively, effectively helped me skip a year at Stanford. So the year I lost by staying in Greece extra, uh, I made up for it when I went to school at Stanford. Uh, at those times, I wanted to be a university professor, which really doesn't line up at all with what I ended up doing in life. But that was a part of uh, a bias that I had growing up in Greece, which was a very socialist, leftist mentality in general as, as a culture and where business was considered to be a corrupt thing to do and impure as compared to pure academic research and the vaulted uh, exploration of academia. So I had a bias of being a professor, doing stuff that was not corrupt and then remaining pure in mind. Uh, I did have a best buddy and I did have a girlfriend, so that was not completely antisocial, uh, but I also had no interest and I wasn't very good at socializing. Uh, that's partly what drove me to computers in the first place. Computers were very self-contained. You would give them instructions. They would do what you tell them. They would tell you what went wrong and you would fix it. People are not like that. People are just chaotic. Uh, and that's fine. That's how they are. But uh, uh, that's what scared me about them and I stayed away from it. But of course, that had to change in order to become an entrepreneur. But that's later on. So from high school, Stanford. And the transition was actually an interesting one. Uh, because for me, it felt like a natural first uh, next step, meaning that if you're smart and you're doing well, then you just go from high school to college. That's just what you do. It didn't occur to me not to do that. It turns out for many people, that's not the right thing. Later on, the same attitude uh, got me in trouble when I went from master's to PhD at Stanford. And it turned out PhD was the completely wrong thing to do. Uh, it just wasn't suitable for what I wanted to do in life. I didn't realize that, that at that time. And effectively, I spent, I did waste time, if you will, making that realization and adjusting course. Uh, so again, for me, it was a natural next step, but that doesn't I mean that applies to everybody else. Uh, I had chosen to go to the English speaking world for college. Uh, and it was either the UK or the US. The UK was the first option because it was affordable. Uh, so I didn't need a scholarship to go there. Schools are very good in the United Kingdom. And I could always go to the US for graduate school which is what my dad actually was hoping to do. He never made it because I was born and I derailed his plans and the family's plans. And so after UK, he came back to Greece. Well, I knew I could go to the US should I wish to do so. Now, the US was the ideal place to go for computer science. I knew that even back then, uh, but it was very expensive. So I had to get a full scholarship, which is what motivated me to get good grades at school in a broad array of subjects because US schools don't look at a single subject. They look at your overall well-grounded foundation for education and your grades across all subjects uh, and beyond uh, beyond uh, subject also extracurricular activities and the like uh, but anyway i had to get a full scholarship and so that's what motivated me to do well all around i did get it and, and then i had to choose between schools now again i was fortunate enough i got into mit princeton many of the top schools I wanted to go to MIT in Princeton, and that was because they had a brand. I knew that of those schools in Greece, MIT was the place to go if you wanted to be a nerd, maybe Caltech. But Stanford just did not occur to me at all. It was my college counselor who suggested Stanford because he would see that I was good. He saw that I was good in many subjects, and he said, well, Stanford is also very broad. You can get a very good broad education, and it's good in computer science, so that's where you should go there. Well, I didn't really, I mean, because of that, I applied at Stanford, uh, but that was not, his opinion was not what would make me go there. 
Uh, it wasn't Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was already pretty substantial in the in the Bay Area, uh, meaning it had already developed a reputation, but it was not what drove me there. It wasn't the reputation of Stanford. It wasn't the fact that it was excellent. The reason I went to Stanford was because I got the brochure, and on top of it, it had a beautiful uh, uh, sky with palm trees, and I got the brochure from MIT with a couple walking in the snow. And so I just picked the place because of the weather. And I'm serious. This was just that random of a decision. Uh, it was a full scholarship both ways, so it was not a financial decision at that point. It was simply because I wanted to be in a warm place. Uh, but as uh, Seneca, a Roman philosopher, says, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And so uh, choosing Stanford was a random choice, uh, meaning it was luck that drove me to end up being in the Silicon Valley, but I was also prepared for it through the work in high school. So uh, I ended up at Stanford, it was the 90s, uh, and that was before the internet really came into public knowledge. It existed before, of course, as a project at SRI International, uh, but it really became publicly available in the mid 90s. Uh, it's a very strong school in computer science. Obviously it was well, uh, very strong then, it still is today even more so. It offered a very well-rounded education. Uh, one thing that I will say to anybody considering computer science is that, uh, Studying computer science in itself will make you a weaker computer scientist than studying something else along with computer science. Uh, most of the awards that go to people in computer science either are bio biologists, physicists, mathematicians. They bring in some other discipline and its concepts into computer science, like neuroscience and AI, or uh, biology and computer graphics, or physics and computer graphics. Uh, the other thing about Stanford is, again, it had this pro curriculum, and that's where I actually learned more about ancient Greece uh, than when I was in Greece, because of the way things were taught. I could see a subject from a different perspective that was much more interesting and motivating. Uh, of course, I built a very strong professional network because Stanford is in the middle of Silicon Valley. Uh, important thing to note is that, uh, and that's generally true about U.S. Uh, colleges, is that you build networks organically, meaning it's not about partying and about schmoozing or just hanging out with the right people. It's, it's simply something that happens with your peers. You just live together, you have a shared experience. Uh, and of course, there is always also uh, opportunities that are random and opportunistic. Like I happen to have a professor who was my advisor freshman year. He was in charge of a NASA project. He knew that I was interested in computers. He had a, a PhD student who needed some assistance because he was a physicist, not a computer guy. And so I became his assistant. And a few years later, I was in charge of uh, writing the uh, ground simulation software for a space shuttle mission. And it all started through this random assignment of me, a random guy in Greece, to this advisor who has just started the NASA project and was looking for a guy to help out. Uh, so again, this is serendipity and you took advantage of it. That was also an environment where I got to be involved in group projects. Everything I had done until then had been pretty much me doodling around on the computer on my own. Uh, but that's where I saw the power of working with a group. And, you know, yes, I had this attitude. I'm the smartest guy. I, well, I wasn't, but I had the attitude. Uh, and I realized that when you work with other people, they can be smarter in ways that you are not. And together you can do more than individually uh, working separately. Uh, and of course, the other opportunity that had happened at Stanford is that I taught a lot of classes. So when I went in the PhD program, which I shouldn't have, uh, I ended up teaching a lot instead of doing research. Uh, and through that process, I ended up teaching a lot of students who became much more successful than I was. Uh, and they left early because they took the master's, not the PhD, or they got the PhD and they actually graduated, unlike me who dropped out. And so those guys ended up uh, being uh, successful in Silicon Valley. They asked me to join them and help them later on. That's how I went to Facebook, by the way, to build their image processing system through a student I had that became the uh, CTO of Facebook or VP of engineering first. Um, the shift to entrepreneurship happened to me um, because I realized at some point that being a professor uh, does not mean you avoid politics, does not mean you avoid corruption. Universities can be just as corrupt as everything else uh, or challenging. I, I'm, corruption is the wrong word. It's not, it's, not, it's not corruption in the sense of money and payments, but in the sense of, sense of trading favors and uh, playing politics. So uh, that exists in academia as well. And so I decided, well, if that's not what I want, uh, maybe I should uh, look into the industry just as much as uh, uh, universities because there is politics everywhere. And well, it turned out that actually the most cutting edge research, which is what I really wanted to do, was happening in the industry, not in the universities when it comes to computer science. 
Uh, and so once I realized that, I left and dropped out of the PhD. And that's when I co-founded the first company. Uh, now, when it comes to startups, I should point out that I have pretty much worked almost exclusively with startups. The exception is if I was with a startup that got acquired by another company, in which case I would end up working to the acquirer, with the acquirer for a couple of months up to a year. Uh, for every one of my startups, startups I work with co-founders. That's because I have never had a single good startup idea. And that's the truth. I can see good ideas that others have and help them materialize and turn, help them turn into, re into reality as a nerd, as an inventor, as a doer, but I'm not the one who comes up with the ideas. Uh, now, people like me tend to have two paths uh, in Silicon Valley. One is to continue doing what I did, which is to become a very strong nerd, remain a nerd for a long time, very strong technically, develop the skills to the point that you are the guru, you are the Yoda. Uh, so every you know young uh, uh, pad one comes to you with advice on how to do to solve these complex technical tasks. That's pretty much the path that I took. The other path is to become a manager. Uh, and that is susceptible to what is called the Peter Principle, which is that people rise up a hierarchy in a corporation to the level where they are incompetent and they cannot rise anymore. Uh, and that's fine, that's, that's okay. But I knew right away that I would be incompetent in management, so I didn't even want to go there. So I just focused on being a stroke nerd. Now, over time, however, I learned a lot of other things about startups. So yes, I wanted to be a nerd in, behind my computer, but as I mentioned before with NASA, I had seen the value of working in a group. And so uh, as a result of working in startups, I couldn't help uh, learn whether I wanted to or not, I learned. Uh, about product, meaning what's the difference between technology and a product. Product is taking technology and packaging it in a way that somebody can actually use it, uh, meaning that it actually serves a purpose that makes somebody's life better. It's not technology in itself, but it's applied technology. Uh, it's learning about business. How do you turn a product into a successful product? How do you get people to adopt it, pay for it, use it, uh, give you feedback about it? The legal aspects of running a business. So all the skills I acquired over time, I never went to business school. This was just a matter of learning on the job. Uh, and of course, learning through marriage. My wife, Christine, next to me, uh, you will see her when I switch away the screen sharing. Uh, she's the one who really trained me on the interpersonal side. So again, she's wife 2.0. I had wife 1.0. That was a failed experiment. Uh, I wasn't ready for it. Clearly, I didn't pay enough attention and I didn't learn enough. I learned something about law because she was a lawyer, actually, Harvard Law. So that was helpful on the legal training, but not much on the interpersonal side. Uh, so Wife 2.0 is the one who trained me in terms of interpersonal skill, getting in touch with the soft, as soft aspects of dealing with people, motivating people, understanding emotions, being sensitive to them, even aspects such as uh, racial sensitivity, gender sensitivity, all these things that I just didn't have I, because I didn't care to have until then. So nowadays, armed with everything I've done in my past, I, I advise and mentor other startup founders. You might think that I would advise them in technology, but that's not at all what I do. Technology opens the door. The fact that I'm a nerd means that I can talk to the CTO of a company uh, and, and they, they trust my opinion and advice. But after a meeting or two with the CTO, it is the CEO that then says, oh, well, now I can trust you to give me advice as I talk to my CTO and help them with all the other dimensions of the business because I need help too. Uh, and so I end up actually doing most of my advising and mentoring on the uh, non-technical side of the business. And it's not even uh, advising in the sense of giving a recipe or a coursework. It's much more, it's less than being a professor and it's more like being a therapist. Uh, starting a company is extremely exhausting, uh, mentally exhausting, emotionally exhausting. Uh, and so it's just being there for a founder to address whatever problem they have in their mind and working them, helping them work through it. So yes, there is concrete knowledge, but a lot of it is uh, this uh, soft aspect of helping them understand that today's fire emergency is not the end of the world and we can work past it. So that's pretty much my, plan, my path from high school all the way to the present. Uh, and a little bit on Christine, who is next to me as well. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, uh, just to give you a little context, uh, I was given less than five minutes to fill this out <laughs> and no context at all. So I will keep this fast. Um, so I am not an immigrant, but my parents were. Uh, I was born in the United States. I am Vietnamese. Uh, I was raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it was rather logical that I was going to end up at a school like UC Berkeley or Stanford. Although I actually did want to go to, I wanted to go to Boston for school. 
Um, so uh, I think both of us uh, had uh, a chance to choose which school and, and we thought we were gonna go East. Um, would have been interesting had we met there, but uh, but we both wound up at Stanford. Mine was mostly because uh, I, I ended up wanting, well, really my mom really wanted me close to home. So I was a good Asian daughter and decided to stay close to home. I give her full credit though, because it was a really great decision. Um, I have a, a degree in both economics and human biology, the issue being that I could not decide whether or not I was going to pursue uh, an MD or an MBA. Uh, turns out I did neither, and, um, and, and now I work in startups. So I, Tolly and I met at a startup company, so I've done marketing and operations for various startup companies. Now I do them exclusively for the startups that Tolly is involved with. Other things... Um, I call myself a mermaid because I swim. And yes, I do often swim in a mermaid tail. Uh, I consider myself a nerd. I am a wife. I am a big sister. I love being a big sister. Um, at some point, I'm actually trying to see if there's a way to become a professional big sister. And um, I am a lover of Yorkshire Terriers. So that's just a little bit extra about me. So let's just launch into the good stuff because I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Tolly. Oh, no, no, not just for me, but for Christine as well. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing and start with your questions. All right. Um, I guess my first question is, um, currently you work with advising investors as a mentor capitalist. Um, I know there are a lot of attendees and even like people at my school and a lot of high schoolers that are aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, and so I, I guess my question is, what do investors look for when they're looking um, at a company, a nonprofit or a product? And what advice would you have? Um, what, what advice would you give to um, these like young aspiring entrepreneurs? Okay, so what they look for is to make money, uh, and and I know that this is a you know tongue in cheek answer, but it's important because uh, it it's very rare that uh, you will find an investor willing to proceed if for some reason they feel that the venture will not make it to be big, uh, and that's specific for venture capital. Now investors can be of a different kind called angel investors, and this is a smaller scale investments that may be driven by other criteria, meaning. Not about maximizing return, but about achieving a certain uh, um, regular vision or, yeah. or, or a vision or a regular return where you see per part of the profits for a long period of time. So, for example, that's the difference between investing in a restaurant that's a good city business uh, that returns, you know, a, a pretty good reasonable sum on an every on an on an every year basis, uh, versus wanting to invest in the next Facebook that's going to go really big and you're going to make a huge bundle. So that's the first distinction. So you have to pick the investor that who's who wants to, whose goals are aligned with yours. Uh, the most common mistake I see essentially is entrepreneurs going for the wrong type of investor. Now, venture capital specifically, again, it's about maximizing return. They want to take big bets. A very inter interesting characteristic is what we call in the investor world uh, the lemmings characteristic. So lemmings are those animals that fall off the cliff at the same time. So the first one falls off, the other ones fall and fall off with it without knowing what they are doing. So that happens in the, in the investing world. So you find that some topics become hot. Social, for example, social networking was very big in the uh, late 2000s, uh, before 2010. Then uh, AI became very big. VR was big for a time. Uh, so they tend to invest in these kinds of topics and they all start investing at around the same time. Now, you might think that's a bit senseless, but there is some rationale to it, which is that if I put money in a company and that company uh, is in some particular space that is not popular, then even if the company does well, will it be able to raise more money later on from somebody else? Chances are no, because the space is not popular, even if it's a good space. And so you find this, uh, uh, this uh, effect where you have to pick a space that is aligned with what VCs or venture capitalists believe is going to be what the market will want. They might not be right, but somehow, ironically, you have to put your company into a packaging that makes it look like the kind of companies they look for. So oftentimes you see companies that are about, say, um, uh, optimizing the food supply chain and putting food into restaurants. They call themselves a blockchain company because crypto piracy was cool. They're not a blockchain company, but they had to use that label because that's what VCs wanted. So uh, I would say that a big part of understanding uh, how to get to entrepreneurs is understanding the venture capitalists and the investors themselves. Uh, oftentimes the mistake that uh, young entrepreneurs make is they think about the power of their own idea. Does it work with, uh, you know, their, their peers? That's good. But if you're, you might create the best possible thing, but if the 
audience doesn't want to hear it, it might be the best song, but if they're not ready to listen, it's not going to fly. So just as much as you have to focus on your idea and your skills, of course, to develop it and your team, all the traditional elements of a good startup, you also be need to be monitoring constantly what investors are looking for in order to get your idea funded, because without money, in the end, you don't have a startup, you have a hobby. I'm also going to add that the composition and strength of the team that you have is a huge factor in whether or not investors are going to participate with you. Um, we've literally been in, been in situations where we had two companies that were doing almost exactly the same thing. And it really came down to which team would we prefer to work with? And that will mean different things to different investors. For some of them, yeah. it will be a gold plated degree or experience at Google or things like that. But you actually might be surprised because some investors don't want that at all. They want someone who's hungry. They want someone who's a self starter, who's a learner, who has brought in other people of different strengths, who wants a diverse team um, that has not just a bunch of nerds who are good at coding, but also a really good salesperson or a really, you know, or CEO with really great vision. So that you'll have to also understand what sort of team your investor is going to look at as well. Also, is your team coachable? Because some investors won't work with a team where you're just so solid on your idea, you're not open to outside input. Um, we've seen a lot of different, and, and again, both teams might be really successful, but the investors might want to work with a certain type of team because they know they have a skill set to add to that. So that's that that's something that I, I see being a critical part as well. Uh, the last thing I would add is that uh, locality, unfortunately, is very important. Mm -hmm. Even if the time of COVID, investors want to work with a team that is local to them. And so you find that 80% of the money invested out of Silicon Valley stays in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so it's very hard, even for very strong ideas, to get investment money uh, if they are from outside the U.S. to receive money from U.S. investors. Uh, now, that can change after a certain level of success has been proven, but it's very hard in the early stages. Thank you. Um, Gary, do you want to ask your question now? Sure. So I had a question about um, what would you consider to be the most common reason why startups fail after being invested in? After being invested in, okay, I can give you a couple. You run out of money. Well, there, there's, yeah, there's one reason every startup fail, which is they run out of money. But why do they run out of money, right? Uh, so there, there are a couple of problems, and again, I can. I can there are different failure modes, is what we call them. I mean, the, the lingo in the in the in the startup world is the failure modes. So the first one is uh, pissing the money away. Essentially, it means that you take the money and you spend it in a way that is just stupid. Uh, it could be that you spend it in ping pong tables and the like. That is unusual, but it does happen. I mean, you know, it makes more fuzz or, or sorry, it makes more buzz. But the most common case is that the money is, is not spent according to a good, effective plan. Uh, now, uh, a couple of other failure modes uh, are that a CEO who is not willing to step back, realizing that he or she is not a suitable person for the next level of the company. It is often the case that the guy or gal who has the initial vision, the ability to form a team together to motivate people to create something up to a certain size is incapable of taking that size to the next level of growth. Uh, it's what we call the startup phase versus the scale-up phase. Uh, Christine and I actually are very well aware of that as a shortcoming in our experience. We stop when a company is about 40 people. Once it has grown to that point, we know that we are absolutely the worst people to take it to the next step because the next step because we've never done it. Uh, and unfortunately, because we have done so well up until this point, people trust our opinion and we tell them, don't trust us from now on. We don't know what the hell we're talking about. So uh, this lack of self-awareness to essentially allow the founder to step back or to bring in additional people to complement them is usually is, is the problem. Essentially, the money comes in, which is a certain level of success and, and proof has been achieved, but it's somebody who doesn't know how to manage the money beyond that. Uh, other concrete problems I can give you, and again, depends on the specific company, of course, but uh, failure to realize that the market has shifted. For example, a startup that started with some vision in, say, tourism in the beginning of the year uh, after COVID is clearly going to suffer. So did they pivot in time? Did they shift to their to a slightly different product that can work and still be sold during the COVID-19 uh, quarantines and problems? Uh, failing to bring good advisors, people that can help uh, the younger, usually entrepreneurs, see around corners, right? Because a, a younger person with less experience cannot see problems that are coming ahead versus somebody who has been there before. A lot of times people assume the investor will do that, but that's not always the case. In fact, that's rarely the case. Uh, the investors try to be as hands-off as possible so the younger entrepreneurs 
should find mentors and advisors to help them, just like I, I do with SRI, but they can find it in a, in, you know, through their own fa family setting or school and the like. Uh, and the last uh, I would mention, by the way, which is a common mistake, and most people don't realize it, is uh, salespeople. So uh, at some point, what, a big part of, of raising money is to be able to uh, hire people to sell your product. So you hire salespeople to do the job. Well, salespeople are very good at selling, and the, the best thing that they can sell is themselves. And so hiring a salesperson is extremely hard because a good salesperson will make you believe they're good, when in fact they're not very good. And so the thing that many founders do, because it's, it's just a very common failure mode, is they say, oh, well, that salesperson didn't work, but let me give them a little more time, a little more time, a little more time. Well, that, that's when the money runs out. So a very common failure mode is fi failing to fire an, um, an, an underperforming salesperson and replacing them with a good one. Or any underperforming and, uh, Yes, or any. That's, yeah. that's correct. But salespeople are a particular problem because they tend to be hired draft right after money comes in. And because you asked me, after raising, that is the most common figure point after raising. Yeah. And I, I'm just going to add here, there's just sort of, it's, it's sort of a soapbox of mine. And that is, um, if you see failure uh, headed in your direction, fail well. Um, I, I've, this is something I talk about a lot with, with different entrepreneurs, but the oft quoted stat is that nine out of 10 small businesses will fail. It's actually much better than that. It's not that bad. It's closer to, it's closer to 75% over five years. I'll have to double check the numbers. Um, but even that I know is not great, great news, but you have to go in knowing that the odds are stacked against you. And you really do not need to have a plan in place when you get close to, you know, you see. And if you don't see failure coming down the line early enough, then yeah, you're a really bad leader. But there will come a point where it will look like failure is inevitable. What do you do at that point? Well, there's a lot of things that you can do to protect your customers, protect your investors, protect your employees, because how you fail is going to be very critical to whether or not you can get up and do it again. Because we have been through failures. I know a lot of entrepreneurs who oh, have been through everybody, failures. Yeah. Yeah, everybody if you're a been. good entrepreneur, you've probably had more than one failure. Um, and so if you fail badly, you may never work in this town again because you will just, you'll have killed your reputation. And Silicon Valley in, investors are very failure tolerant. If there's been a failure in terms of, you know, those failure modes totally talked about and you dismantled your company in the right moral way, that's fine. They will give you more money to start again because they said, well, you've got, had a great experience, now do it better. But if you failed like the way Theranos failed or there's a bunch of other you know, companies that have failed in a way that was immoral and, and in a way that harmed people around them, you will have a very hard time doing it again. So that's just my soapbox. All right, thank you. Um, okay, I have another question for Tolly. So um, I guess like towards your... Um, career path, you explore different um, things. So you did a PhD and then you dropped out and you realized that you didn't want to do management. So then um, you ended up becoming a mentor capitalist. Um, what advice would you have for people who um, like, especially high schoolers or younger um, college students, like what advice would you give them um, for those who are trying to figure out their own career path and what they want to do in the future? Aha, that's a very good question because this is an answer that keeps changing over time. It used to be that typical, typical advice is find something that you love and become a total specialist in it, meaning become the best in the world at being, say, a neurosurgeon or being a computer scientist or whatever it is. Uh, and that's, that's fine if that's the case and, and you love something, by all means, go for it. Uh, but many people are realizing that there is a lot of strength, uh, especially as an entrepreneur, in being a generalist. In other words, learn one thing well enough so that you have some depth and have cultivated the ability to create depth. But uh, don't necessarily limit yourself because we are entering a time where a specialist, specialist professions can disappear at any point. Uh, you know, you might, be the best, you might have been the best person to be a manufacturer on the assembly line of a car, but these, are all getting, these all got replaced by robots in the 70s. So there are more and more professions where AI and technology development is going to replace uh, existing skills and a lot more new professions that are going to be created. So if you're in high school and college, you have so much time until you actually join the workforce that it's going to be impossible to know what jobs are going to be available in the future. So 
focusing today on what your profession is going to be, it's like suicide. You're planning for something that may not exist. Uh, so I would say take advantage of a big strength of the U.S. educational system and, and others, not, not only the U.S., which is to cultivate breadth in addition to depth. And a way to sum it up is you don't learn a subject, you learn how to learn anything. In other words, you learn adaptability. That's what it's about. So that's the thing I would, I would uh, focus anyone on doing. It's, yes, learn something that could be a reasonable starting point, but remain adaptable, keep learning as you go, and keep learning outside your domain, uh, whether it's from computer science to learn adjacent fields. And I'm not talking about from computer science to electrical engineering. That's too adjacent. I'm talking about if you write software that is applied in the context of payroll and accounting. So if you're an engineer for turbo tax, well, learn something about accounting as you do that. You know, so broaden your skills because as you learn about accounting, accounting will force you to learn about business. So you're not going to be a one-sided person who can only fit in a very narrow profession in a single space. Uh, that's not a, a, a bad thing should it happen, but it has the very high risk that it will end up being completely incompatible with what the world needs in the future. Yeah, I would, I would also just add to that is that you guys are at a time in your life right now where having a plan makes sense. So like you probably all have a five year plan to get into a certain college or a certain type of college to graduate with a certain type of degree. And these five year plans, because I am a five year plan type of person, this is what gets you into college. And it might get you into a graduate program or medical school or whatever it is that your next steps are. But once you're actually in a job, a five year plan may not be all that useful. And that's something you're gonna have to learn how to break yourself of when you start having a career path. Now, of course, certain types of careers do have sort of a linear path that you can follow. And yes, maybe a five year plan makes sense if you wanna be a cardiothoracic surgeon. But for us, a lot of it is being open to opportunities. So again, when Tolly graduated CS, you know, in the dark ages, the internet had just started, right? Or we had no idea what the mobile phone revolution was going to be or that such a thing would exist. And so if you have flexibility in, like if he just had a five-year plan to keep being a professor, he would have missed out on all these opportunities that just bloomed up. And, and when these revolutions come, they come fast. And if you want to take advantage of them, you it's, it's almost like being a surfer. You have to see the wave and you have to catch that wave. So um, I, just have, I just want you to make sure that you build in room for flexibility and the ability to take advantage of opportunities as they come. Because if you lock yourself into too strict of a five-year plan, um, you're going to miss those opportunities. And, and maybe you'll end up where you wanted to be, but maybe if you'd followed this other path, you'd be happier or be a better alignment. So just to, just to have some flexibility in that. Um, there is a book that I work with on some people. It's way too early for you, but maybe when you're towards, you know, towards the end of your college years, it's called Designing Your Life. Um, it right now. <laughs> I literally just came from a <laughs> from a group where I was working on this book, um, but this was done by two Stanford professors um, in the D school, which is the design school. But they literally apply design principles to designing your career path. Um, and so again, this is too early for you, but it is something to keep. If you're at Stanford, take the class. But if you're not, this class is available for like, I don't know, $20 or something off of Amazon. So, um, so just to, you know, there are ways that you can plan it out and apply those sorts of principles that take your values into account as well as your qualifications and what you want to do. Thank you. So I, I'm going to ask some questions from Menti um, from the audience. So the first one is, how do you drive innovation inside of startup and differentiate yourself in a world where most teams are so similar, besides simply doing something else? Driving innovation in a startup is, uh, the best way to drive it is actually to be market driven. And so that is a very common challenge for startups that are founded by tech people. Uh, so tech people like to think that the innovation is technology driven. Essentially, you know, Google is doing this or the language allows me to do the, 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 langu the programming language I'm using allows me to do that. Uh, but no, innovation should be driven by looking constantly at what the market needs, what your customers want uh, and figuring out the best, best ways to address them. That's why it's a startup. Now, if it was a research project at the university, it's a completely different goal, right? I mean, in a university setting, you have different drivers. It's about getting grants in order to fund your research. But in a startup, it is a business. Its goal is to make a profit. That's why investors gave you money. So the whole goal is to look at what the market needs and constantly finding creative ways to address them. 
so yeah, innovation is customer driven. It's as simple as that. It's not engineering driven. And and talking about uh, going back to Gary's question earlier about failure modes, a common failure mode, especially with startups that are started by ex Google people or ex Facebook people, is to say engineering first. That's just dumb stupid. If it's engineering first, that makes sense if your customers are engineers. He's allowed to say this because he worked at Facebook for a few years, just to let you know. Yeah, and I, I did quite a bit of it. So, yeah. yes, I, I, and I can, yes, I can say that. And that doesn't mean they're stupid people. They're very smart people, but they do not understand that what, made, what creates success for an individual within Facebook and within Google is very different that makes somebody successful in the context of a startup. In Google, Facebook, you can get big bonuses and stock or whatever for being a great engineer and doing pure technical innovation. That's wonderful. Somebody else worries about the money, which is the ad group. They, they are the ones that produce money. Nobody else does in the company. In a startup, you don't have an ad group. You don't have a printing press of money in the basement. And so you actually have to do stuff that is useful, not just beautiful technologically in itself. Um, someone asked, else asked, um, are there any positives to pursuing computer science as academia and getting your PhD? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the fact that the PhD was the wrong choice for me, that doesn't mean it was the wrong choice, that is the wrong choice in general. Uh, and there, there are a lot of positives. I can give you one example, actually, by... Uh, uh, the Mehran story. Well, actually, Mehran and James, actually. Yeah, that's true. All right, okay. go, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about James. James actually was a classmate of mine, uh, a very bright guy. We were always in competition, very friendly competition between us. He was even my roommate for a while. Uh, well, he actually got his PhD when I, when I dropped out. Uh, he went on to become a professor at Carnegie Mellon for a couple of years, and then he went to Google. Uh, and Google very much rewards uh, PhD level of expertise. He became pretty much one of the world experts in robotics. Uh, he was at Google for several years, was one of the early people with a self-driving car. He did another project that was, uh, can't talk about it. Uh, and then uh, he did another project in robotics. Well, at some point he was discovered by Toyota who wanted to start a research uh, lab in the Bay Area and he was hired as their uh, CTO. And after doing that for a couple of years, uh, he was asked to go to Japan and become CEO of the brand new Toyota Advanced <coughs> research division and now he is uh, uh the <coughs> i i think he is if not the only one of the two non-japanese uh people on toyota's board of directors so his career path came academia phd um uh, you know a folk, he is truly the, a, a very very bright individual extremely smart way better than i am clearly uh, when it comes to academic knowledge, and he was able to acquire enough tech skills on the way. Now, he still asks my advice about how to invest in startups, and I tell him not to because he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, but of course, if I were to be on the Toyota board, I wouldn't know what I'm doing either. Uh, so, you know, it's complementary skills. But you can talk about Mara. Well, actually, I was going to mention Pat Hanrahan because I feel like he's like the gold standard. Yeah, Pat Hanrahan is, yeah. is the gold standard. He so, just got the award, the Turing Award, yeah. Right. Okay, so Pat Hanrahan is, a, if you don't know, he was one of the founders of Tableau Software, which you should know if you're in Seattle. But before then, he was, was he part of Pixar? Pixar. Yeah, okay, Pixar. Thank you. So, PhD, professor, helped founded Pixar, helped founded Tableau. So, he has something like, he's got like an Oscar He's got a billion dollars from Tableau and he recently got the touring award. Okay. So that's, that is the ultimate, like, you know, yes, you can follow academia and make all those dreams come true. Absolutely. Yes. Pat Hanrahan did, hand did it. And then, um, but he started with a biology degree. Oh, is that what it was? That, okay. uh, well, that, that's yeah, the multidisciplinary aspect. Of there, it, yeah. there, there you go. But, and, but he is of a generation that is, that is older than we are. Yeah. So he's had a lot of time to do all of this, but Mayron is also, he's of totally his generation and mind you totally went to school with larry and sergey of of google so we're not even mentioning them but um and they got their phd but um but mayron got his phd he and totally were were roommate not roommates dorm mates they would run into each other in the showers that sort of thing and um mayron again phd worked at google and then he went back to stanford and now is the head of the computer science program at stanford so, so we know lots of PhDs who have done super well. It wasn't a good fit for Tolly, but it was clearly a fit for a lot of other people we know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, th think of it as my failure as compared to the <laughs> failure of the PhD program. <laughs> okay. Um, someone else asked if you were 17 years old today and uh, 
if you are 17 years old today and can learn coding yourself and want wait if someone was 17 years old and can learn coding by themselves and wanted to start a company do you think having an undergraduate um degree in computer science is worth the time ah, yes and no um i would say this if you have an idea for a company give it a shot because so what you go to school a year earlier uh, sorry a year later i did that and there's nothing wrong with just delaying a year you will acquire some experience you'll know better whether you really love computer science or not you'll realize maybe that what you need to do is uh, go to business school instead or design school uh so i would say by all means uh pursue it uh now the challenge we apologize to your parents in advance yes i i, I say i blame peter thiel peter thiel is the one who says that says don't go to college yeah. instead go don't blame to something. yeah don't blame me just believe peter thiel <laughs> Uh, Peter Thiel is actually one of the PayPal founders and an extremely well-known investor with very unconventional views. His view is that people really should not go to college at all because it's a waste of time. I don't go that far, but I would say that uh, uh, it's totally fine to spend a year exploring uh, something that feels that is the right uh, thing for you to do now. Even if you're wrong, it will help you, again, as failure always does, it will teach you something about yourself so that you will make the most out of your college experience instead of feeling that you're constrained, resentful, uh, and really not ready to do it. So absolutely. Uh, the, I, I would add though, however, uh, make sure that you find the right people to surround you and advise, advise you because at 17, uh, you still have a lot of gaps in your knowledge. And the biggest gap is that you probably don't know you have many gaps. Uh, and so that, that is the biggest weakness. So realize you have gaps and find people to help you so that you will turn this experiment into as much of a uh, learning experience as possible, hopefully success, you know, and that, that way you can pay for your way through college by buying your own degree. Um, and then I have a question of my own, I guess, um, kind of going back towards what we were talking about um, with finding your own career path. Um, Christine, especially as someone like I, I also am like the type of person to kind of like want to plan out like what I want to do. Um, how do you kind of break out of that shell and like learn to take risks and like go towards you marry options? someone? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too early for you. I'm not recommending that because that would kill me. Um, I think that's a really good question. I think that when you talk about having a plan, just think of it as like a skeleton. So this is what you're hanging things on and you are taking that path and you're just going to follow it. But just to always be aware of other things out there that you know, interest you or that will come up. Um, because I think as long as you're observing and as long as you're open, you will see those opportunities come up. I do really want to strongly encourage that you take academic risk because that is my, if there was something in my life that I were to regret, it was to not take enough academic risks in college. Now, high school does not reward you for that. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, you want a well-rounded education, but because my goal was to get into Stanford, I, my mind was around, I have to be, I, have, I need straight A's. I need 1600 on the SAT. I know it's a different number now, but I, I, these were my, my goals, but when you get to college, that doesn't matter as much anymore. Now that still mattered to me because my goal was medical school or an MBA. So I was still trying to get good grades, but that hindered me because there were courses that I would have taken were I not so afraid of doing so. I would have taken more physics. I would have taken more math. I would have taken more things that I would have gotten, oh, God forbid, a B in, um, that I didn't because I was so concerned about getting good grades. So. I mean, I probably would not have gotten my biology degree if I could look back. I would have probably done not CS, but there's a degree called symbolic systems, which has computer science as part of it. And that, you know, because I love linguistics and language. And so that would have been such a good fit for me. But I was so focused on becoming a doctor that I completely missed all the cues and opportunities that came my way. However, I still took a jazz class when I was at Stanford. I still took a coding class at Stanford. So just leave yourself open for those, you know, classes, don't hopefully, you know, don't worry about getting the A's in everything and try to get let go of sort of your sense of perfection. Because again, one of my great accomplishments in life was learning to not be a perfectionist anymore. And I always love to say anything worth doing is worth doing badly. I am the worst surfer in the world. I am the worst skier in the world. I surf and ski all the time because I love it, right? I am learning Chinese at the age of 44 because I just felt like it, even though I suck at it. And I just do it now. And these were the things that I wish I'd done more of when I was younger and, and more afraid to try. But that, that's my 
that's my piece. Well, I would add also that both of our, uh, we both have younger sisters. And one of the things that we saw with them is that how their hobbies uh, transitioned into a much, they took essentially a, a life of their own later in their life. And so right now, yes, have a plan. It's all around academics. It's, it's actually easy. You don't have to come up with a plan. It is get good grades. That will get you to college. Get good grades to go to graduate degree. Fine, do that. But uh, in the paying more attention to what you do the rest of your time. So in Christine's sister's case, it was cooking on the side, which eventually translated into becoming a TV chef. That is the career that she ended up doing. Uh, in the case of my sister, she always had an interest in the arts and in working with people. And over time, she realized that it, she, be, she would become a therapist working with disabled children. Uh, and that path was not a linear path. That was not what degree she was getting or what she was planning to do. It happened in a very random organic, ra organic fashion, right? Yeah. But the interest started getting cultivated at a very young age through hobbies and side activities. So engage in those activities because that's where you're going to find out, that's where you're going to learn yourself. That's where you're going to fi fi figure out where your interests truly lie and what really inspires you, motivates you, what you really love. Yeah, allow your curiosity to guide you, even if it yeah. seems scary. Yeah, and it could be like singing. I mean, I know Christine did a bunch of that as well. And the nice thing, at least about U.S. colleges, is that they reward this type of uh, extracurricular activity if it is not at the expense of academics. You still need the good grades, uh, but you actually get rewarded if you have these extracurricular elements in your in your application as well. Um, so throughout this talk, I guess we've talked about like having a lot of academic breadth um, and like having those extracurriculars, having those hobbies. Um, I guess like I think for high schoolers and like especially like my group of friends um one thing that kind of shies people away from like taking these opportunities and learning new things is the fear of failure especially as you get older um whenever you learn something new you always feel like you're behind um other people that have done it earlier than you um and have like um already gone to a level that you feel like you can't reach um and you can't catch up with how do you kind of combat that sort of mindset well, as the person who just started learning Chinese six months ago, um, they, you know, they, you've heard the saying, you know, shoot for the moon, you'll land among the stars. Um, or the other one is like, at some point, somebody said, well, if I go to med school now, I'll be 40 by the time I become a doctor. Well, you're going to become 40 anyway. So why don't you just, you know, pursue what it is that you want to pursue or what interests you because you're going to get older anyway. Um, so I think um, I actually envy people of your age right now just because your access to learning things is so easy. Like, I, I swear, if I had Hello Chinese like 10 years ago, I would have learned it a lot faster. You know, I would have been on it 10 years ago. Or I taught myself how to crochet a few years ago thanks to YouTube because I never did. I tried books and it never worked before. So I think the fact that it's so close, like, take advantage of that. Um, and again, y'all are so young. Um, for those of us, and again, we picked up surfing in our 40s. It is never too late to start something. Um, and yes, there's like the whole 10,000 hours of mastery and things like that. But if you really love it, those 10,000 hour, 10, hours are going to fly like that. And you know what? If you get 5,000 hours, that's fine too, as long as you enjoy doing what it is that you're doing. Uh, well, I would add to what you were saying, because what, what resonates with, with me with what you said is that I remember being a, a, at that age and thinking that uh, I, I needed to be very good at something and get rewarded and get the A's and get the public approval, if you will, uh, because that was key to me feeling self-confident to also try things where I was not very good at. And so definitely find one or two things that you are good at so that you desire that self-confidence that I'm not a useless failure in everything. So you need that. I, I get that. Uh, but and use that as a, as a way to uh, to, uh, but, you know, to to give you emotional support and the strength to try the things where you are not good at and learn from. And I think too, with um, I feel like there's more feedback mechanisms now. So you need to figure out what feedback will motivate you. So for some people, it might be posting your progress on social media because then you'll be held accountable. For some, it might be nobody gets to find out about this at all, and I'm going to do this in secret because I don't want anybody, you know. So there is sort of a, uh, what I don't envy your generation is a performative part of social media where you constantly have to feel like what you're putting out there is your best self or your best. And so 
Um, I actually like the people who put out their failures on social media because they look real. But um, but regardless, I mean, if it motivates you to put something good out there, great. But if it motivates you to keep it all secret, do that too. So so you just need to know what's going to drive that. Yeah, and, and largely I would say that should you fail or not be good at something, because again, I failed plenty of times and everybody who's done a startup has failed. Again, I'm considered successful and I've had the 50% success rate. rate. I mean, I had 50% failures, right? Okay. So, but that's because every failure, I don't see it as a failure reflecting on me personally. It is a mistake from which I have to learn. It's only a failure if I learn nothing. So if you shift your perspective and don't see it as I messed up, but rather I learned something that changes, I think at least for me, it changes completely your worldview of how you perceive that as an experience. You see, there's another stepping stone towards the goal that you seek to to achieve and, and reach. Yeah, either it's a good experience or a really good story to sell somebody later. Heck yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'll give you one example. I mean, I I, I didn't mention it there, but uh, just to, sh I, I only mentioned the good stuff in terms of my career, but, and I won't even go into failures, but I will say in 1993, when the internet was starting, I was at Stanford. I was uh, uh, doing computer graphics at the time. And so my workstation looked the prettiest. It had the nicest pictures there, right? So two of my classmates sitting right behind me, they were uh, doing their own thing and they saw my beautiful workstation and they asked me if I would uh, put together some graphic stuff for them. And I did, uh, and they put it on that new thing, HTML, GIF, JPEG, web thing. Uh, and it, it looked really good. And so they asked me to join their company. And, though, and my response was, well, no, the internet is a fad. Nobody's gonna use the internet in a year. Uh, and I don't want to join you. And those guys did Yahoo. So I'm just pointing out, I had to learn over time. So call that a failure, call it a humongous failure. That does not work. It's a good story. It's right? a good story. And I learned something from it because <laughs> next time I got asked to join, next time I also said no, and that was another success. But the third time I actually learned my lesson and I said, yes. Um, yeah, I think um, adding on to that, someone asked, um, what is your biggest regret if there is one, if it's not that one? And how did you learn from that experience? Someone asked that. Well, I don't have any regrets, actually. I mean, because I learned from all the experiences. So it was not, there's nothing to regret. But uh, I've made mistakes. And that was one of the big ones. My first marriage was another mistake. Uh, but of course, if I didn't have that fail, I would not have met my lovely wife. So, you know, it, 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 pays, out, it pays off in the end. Uh, so, no, I wouldn't say there was anything that I made a, a huge mistake uh, that was not correctable. Or, or rather, I wasn't able to make up for it later on. Uh, Christine actually touched on one thing that I, I wish I would have done, but again, I wouldn't call it a, a horrible regret. Uh, Stanford had so many opportunities for me to learn outside the classroom in other subjects. And yes, I did that with ancient Greek and a few other topics, but I didn't spend as much time because I, I, was, I had to work in order to make money for my scholarship, right? I didn't really have the time. Uh, but there were so many things I could have done in terms of getting to know the Stanford community, other people socializing that I didn't do. Plus, being a computer science nerd, I loved my computer and I didn't feel comfortable as much around people. And so I missed the networking, if you will. But eventually I made up for it. And now these days, back in those days, I would go in front of the business school and think everybody in there was stupid because they're not engineers. Now I actually give lectures at the Stanford Business School uh, and actually learn from the students because they're smarter than I am. So... I learned. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So since um, time's almost up, um, I'll ask the last question on Menti, and it's: um, Do you think it's necessary for start founders to acquire a college degree in the field of their startup, or do you think hiring um, employees in that field um, can help fill that technical gap? Uh, for it, it depends what role they play. In, in other words, there are two parts to a startup: there is strategy and tactics, or strategy and execution. Strategy is the high level picture of what, where are we heading? What are we building? What market are we trying to serve? Execution is about actually getting things down, building the product. Uh, so you can definitely hire people at the tactical level to build things, but when it comes to strategy, you need to have the knowledge. That knowledge that, however, doesn't mean that you have to go to school for it. It doesn't mean that you have to get a degree in it. Because if it takes you four years to learn enough in order to, before you can even go to the domain, by the time you graduate, the domain may not exist. The market might have moved on. Somebody else may have designed whatever you wanted to build. Uh, so I would say, again, going back to getting as much of a generalist foundation and learning as you go. Uh, so it's not about a degree. It's about 
a degree giving you the foundation of learning that allows you to learn on an ongoing basis throughout your life so that you can then adopt and expand it to new territory and new opportunities as they present themselves. It's the preparation part, you combine it with opportunity and you have success. Um, so I think um, the time's basically up. Um, thank you so much, Christina and Tolly, for um, joining us and speaking. And um, let's see, uh, if you guys want to see more events like these throughout um, our hackathon, Hack the World, um, make sure to check our social media, um, which will be on the live, YouTube live stream. And we'll be posting more updates on other speakers and AMAs like this and other workshops as well. And then for our Hack the World attendees that are here, um, our next event will be Kahoot at 7 p.m. and that information will be on the Discord. So thank you guys for all joining this live stream and we'll end it here. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys.